remember, to give you a context for this, is that, that basically every decision you make, uh, you will have two advisors in your mind. Uh, the ego is your past learning. Everything you've learned, seemingly from parents, preschool, kindergarten, all the way through grade school, high school, if you've ever had any college, vocational training, all that training, every single thing you learned, and I mean everything without exception, is the ego. Everything. There's nothing that you've learned that is of the spirit. Now, it's like all that learning is stacked up in there, like layers and layers, and this small, still voice knows that everything that you've learned about all time and space is, is an attempt to cover over the kingdom of heaven. Your perfection that you were, you were given when you were created uh, wasn't something that needed to be built up. God gave you everything in your creation. That's original innocence. <laughs> Forget original sin. <laughs> you were given original innocence. <laughs> and you got the whole package, all the might and glory of the kingdom of heaven. The Course says, the kingdom of heaven is within. The word within is actually unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. You can leave the within out. So everything that God learned it now has to be unlearned. And even when the Course talks about learning and curriculum goal and forgiveness, it's just kind words. But what, if you really hang in there with what he's talking about, he's talking about peeling that onion and getting down to that bright core that's been there forever and it was always going to be there. Mm -hmm. So, when you start to think of it that way, that means that at every point during this awakening, you're going to have to choose between your own past learning, you know, what you were taught, and the Holy Spirit. And what Rob is saying and what I'm saying is, is that in many cases, your own past learning will say, okay, let's be logical, let's be rational, uh, let's look at this thing with some prudence uh, and be responsible. And this voice is going to be saying, you know, the most responsible decision you can make in any situation is the peaceful, joyful, happy one. And sometimes the ego will come in there and say, you've got to be kidding me. You know, you've got to be kidding me. Now, I'll give you an example about, because I hear this word coming up, responsibility. Let's go right at this responsibility thing. Yeah. Accountability, responsibility. I'm sorry, I'm sorry at all. Let's, hey, everybody. Let's go right at this. We all need to hear this. We all need to hear this. I get a responsibility to do it. If you're a Course in Miracles student, you're going to hear this from left and right. You're like, oh yeah, this is another pious guy, be happy thing. Yeah. 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 I went to Michigan one time, and I was in this big a room this size, and everybody was around, and and we, I said, let's go after this responsibility one. Let's let's do this topic tonight. And everybody said, oh great. So I said, we're going to do a participation thing. And in the in the crowd was all doctors, lawyers, teachers, parents. You know, there was even an elected judge. <laughs> In, in our system of government, an, an elected judge, I'm going to give my talk about non-judgment, who was actually there, he got, and he participated as well, he participated. They said, now, everybody go around the room, does anybody have any feelings of responsibility in your mind? All the hands go up. I said, tell me about them, pour them out there. Parents, I'm responsible for my children. I'm responsible for my mortgage. I'm, you know, financially responsible. The judge, I have a constituency. I'm responsible to those who elected me. I'm responsible to the Supreme Court. I'm responsible to uh, uphold the laws of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, we have business people. Uh, I'm responsible for my shareholders and the bottom line. You know, to operate to stay, you know, in the in the black or with, uh, above the red. Everybody there poured out their responsibilities. Come on, get them all out on the table. I said, now, does anybody here have any feelings of guilt? Ever? <laughs> all the hands go up. Well, what do you feel guilty about? Well, that I won't be a good enough parent, that I won't uphold the Constitution, that I'll make a mistake, that, that I, I won't be a good enough citizen to support my country, that I won't be a good enough neighbor, uh, that I won't be a, a good enough... Uh, uh, son or daughter to my parents, so I let them down. I mean, on and on. Everybody poured out all their guilt feelings. I said, so it seems like there's a connection here between responsibilities and guilt. I said, is there any way 
that you can feel completely innocent and completely guiltless and completely sinless and have all the responsibility the way that that's set up and everybody shook their head. They said, no way. No way. So, so I said, good. All we've done is we've established a connection here. The ego must be involved in this uh, picture somehow because the ego needs you to feel guilty to maintain itself. And the ego doesn't want you to be innocent. So if you're innocent, then the ego's out of business. But the ego's got to keep... Now, so I said, let's go into it a little deeper. Let's take some, the idea of like a parent. Okay? you got a mom or dad concept. How good is good enough? How good is a good enough mother? How good is a good enough father? You see how the ego's got the concept there? And it's going to come at you. Did you do enough for their birthdays? Did you give them enough education? Did you give them enough, you know, care and well-being and everything? You can do that with any concept. Concept of citizenship, concept of husband and wife, concept of being a daughter or a son, niece or nephew. You can do it with concepts of of business people. I mean, being an actor. How good is a good enough actor? You know, I mean, what do you, you can see how these concepts are set up so that you'll always be guilty because you're never good enough. Because how good is good enough? The ego's going to keep moving the bar. <laughs> how smart are you? Smart enough. How many degrees until you're, you're smart enough? You see, if the ego keeps moving the bar, you know, it's going to keep saying you, you're dumb. You're stupid. So, here comes the Course in Miracles, and the Course in Miracles says, has the audacity to say, your sole responsibility is to accept the atonement for yourself. And what he described in atonement is, is the, is the correction for the error of separation. He's going to say in the Course in Miracles, I know you don't believe this, I know you think you got financial problems, relationship problems, small problems, or pollution problems, or traffic problems. I know you think you got biochemical problems, you got problems with nuclear waste. I know you think you got political problems. I know you think you got all kinds of problems, but the only problem you have is you believe you're separate from your God, separate from your Creator, your Source. And, and he says, I'm going to have to convince you that that's the only problem, and that the ego made up a world, a hall of mirrors, to keep you guilty, to keep you guessing, to keep you off guard, so that you would never go back and lift that cornerstone. And if you think you made a bargain with the devil, the ego doesn't want you to ever question that bargain. <laughs> you signed in blood, and you are guilty, and you're going to pay for eternity, and you're going to pay for time. And the Holy Spirit is addiction. Yes, and addiction to pain and misery and guilt. So it takes a lot of faith to open up a book that says your sole responsibility is to accept the atonement, to be happy, to be joyful, to be free, to be peaceful. That's all God wants, is you to wake up from this dream of sickness, sin, suffering, and death, and remember how beautiful you are, how perfect you are. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I'm teaching about responsibility is, is the Holy Spirit wants suffering and death, and remember how beautiful you are, how perfect you are. And, and so what I'm teaching about responsibility is, is the Holy Spirit will never have you abdicate on responsibilities. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, the things will get met. If you go to the grocery store, the groceries get bought, mm -hmm. but you have a bunch of holy encounters. <laughs> in the aisles. You go to the laundry mat, the clothes get washed, but you shine your light. You shine your light. You let your true colors come shining through. You know, you may go on trips, you may do things, and the world may say they seem like mundane things, but they aren't. You're bringing all the light of heaven with you in everything you do, everything you think, say, and do. So, you can see where this is going, that, that those responsibilities will be handled, but in the end, your one responsibility is to accept that correction in your mind. And you, you can't lose sight of that, because the ego is going to try to come in there and going to try to say, you can't do it, you'll never be able to do it, it'll take too long, um, you don't have the resources, you know, it's going to try to throw every kind of excuse it can, including the kitchen sink, to block you from, from going for this. Mm -hmm. But when we come together in these kind of meetings, this is our, like, our support group for God. <laughs> uh, I, my name is so-and-so, I have a perceptual problem. <laughs> I'm seeing a world that doesn't even exist. I'm, I'm, 
was quite a little bit away, so I managed to go in there and lay down. And I think I was five days in a coma. And I was lying there and no water, no food and nothing. It got stiffer and horrible more. And I went through like Dante, uh, takes you through the hands and uh, happens. Yeah. I had this experience falling, 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 so turned up again. And I was saying, I said, well, I'm dying right here, but I have a leaving a mess where I want to say, find me. Then I came out of this coma and said, I hear the voice, child, get up now, go to your house and have a shower. And said, there'll be no sickness anymore. Who, who is here? And I started moving and then I, on my floor, I, I started to crawl and got out of this horse stable, it was really horse stable. Mm. I could stand and then I marched slowly back to the house and I had this shower and everything was gone. No pain, nothing. Even people told me if you come fairly out of this, you're going to practice and I was just in my life I got poisoned through uh, pains which I painted I got poisoned to real poison I really was a four times in the coma the this came out and the voice comes says now child get up go and have a shower <laughs> and right in at 10.30 and I do and everything is gone this is a, this is a miracle. And then I, I told the doctor I am not going to have any health insurance and since ever I have no health insurance, nothing like this. Mm. Mm. Well, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought up the topic of sickness because I'll say this much. And I'm going to talk about some deep stuff now. So just be ready and let it come in. Uh, this world seems like it's uh, six billion people uh, striving not to die. Uh, <laughs> survival is uh, trying to live another day, uh, trying to eat the right things, do the right things, exercise, have jobs, build shelters for the for the body and everything. I tell you this: uh, fear has nothing to do with the body dying. Uh, there's six billion people that are afraid of dying, and there's only one mind underneath all that huge menagerie that's afraid of living. <laughs> One mind afraid of living. And when I mean living, I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven. That the mind that was so afraid, thought it had separated from God, fragmented itself into seemingly six billion and more, trillions and zillions of little pieces, uh, tried to shatter itself into such tiny little pieces that seem so little and weak and vulnerable that they dare not do anything more than try to survive another day. And what I'm going to tell you now is what the fear is, is the fear is of intimacy. And we're not talking about these workshops where they talk about fear of sexual intimacy. We're talking about the intimacy to drop the mask of being a, a tiny little private little human. You know, just lowering that mask and it seems like it's, it's a thing of vulnerability. You know, if you take your guard down, if you let down all the defenses, you know, when people even go out on first dates, they always say, put the best foot forward, make a good first impression. If you don't make a good first impression, you don't get a second date, you know? And, and the world would say, too, job interviews, or even in terms of uh, relationships, everything. Future, Jesus says in the Course, Future loss is not your concern and worry. Your real dread is present joining. Present joining. There is nothing more frightening than present joining. That's why when you meet people sometimes in the street, you know, people look the other way, everybody's concerned about personal space. Uh, you go to groups and there's always like, who's going to break the ice, you know? Uh, you go, go out on a date. There's an awkwardness and nervousness if you go on a date and meet somebody for the first time. All this awkwardness and all this ambiguity and all this, you know, not feeling comfortable and everything is a fear of intimacy of the greatest kind. It's a fear of the present moment. So think about it. All this energy that's spent in trying not to get sick and not to die, eating things, pills, 
running around, building shelters and defense mechanisms and missiles and missile shields now, billions of dollars put into defense mechanisms, all because it protects the body. And if you get down deeper into the mind, you see that it's not the body that needs protection. Protect your soul by forgiving. Uh, protect your awareness of your spirit by letting go of, of judgments and hurts and grievances. That's the way to get down to this true intimacy. Now, in relationships, it seems like people, everybody's running around looking for soulmates and trying to fall in love with that one true love, and if they even believe it is possible. And so you have people trying to come together, but the ego is in there trying to say, let's forge a pact and let's make a relationship. So let's make a little haven from this storm of guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, so in relationships, two people come together and basically it's kind of like, I'm looking for somebody who will love me, respect me, treat me with unconditional love and this and that. Basically, when you're looking for a partner that's going to do that, you're looking for a God substitute. Uh, because there is no human being alive that is going to be able to pull that up. And, and the way the ego has got this whole game set up is it's saying, all right, you potential partner, come back. Uh, I'll date you. Uh, out of the three billion, I'm going to give you a shot at being the one. Uh, but just remember that if you don't love me unconditionally, if you make some false moves, you are out of there before you can help. There's a lot of fish out there in the sea, and I'm going to give you a shot. But believe me, if you don't live up, you are out of there. And I call that Dixie Cup relationships. You ever seen the Dixie Cup play out of the thing where you pull them down and then you throw them away? That's the human condition. It's Dixie Cup relationships. Throw them away, throw them away. And now you can go online and you can go into dating services and video dating. I mean, it's gone way. The Dixie Cup idea has caught on. Now, the other thing is, is commitment. I mean, the only thing about, there's nothing really special about a marriage commitment except that, that when your mind is so conditioned into this dream, but the ego doesn't believe that commitment's possible at all. So the Holy Spirit has to use these stepping stone commitments, like diet commitments, exercise commitments, and even relationship commitments. You know, when you marry somebody, you're making a commitment. And it really is a commitment not in bodies. You know, we're going to hang on to these bodies, but it's more, we're going to hang in there when this ego rears its head. And we're going to hang in there and try to join. We're going to try to let this go of all these hurts and grievances. And when you, that's what relationships, that's what makes them so difficult, is because they're like mirrors. And what you find in a relationship, in all relationships, is a mirror of what you unconsciously believe is true. So if you get angry at a partner, you still have the deep-seated anger that you haven't released. And if you have any kind of anger or hurt or pain, it just really means that your connection with your source is still broken. Because if you're lined up with your source, God is pure love, you're not going to feel pain and hurt and guilt and shame and all those things and anger. You're going to feel just the divine love. So all these seeming relationships just give you opportunities to, to fast track. This is the fast track back to the kingdom of heaven. Silence and re relationships really give you the best opportunities at flushing this ego up. Because all you know when you try to meditate, you know all that yak and yak chatters in there. The ego is not happy at all with this meditation idea. Uh, no sense to give it up, you know. And if you get in relationships, it's not happy at all with the intensity of the emotions. Because a lot of us have gone through a lot of hurts with these relationships. And at times, you know, the ego's saying, just, you need to do the Dixie Cup thing or be a hermit. <laughs> just never do that one again. But, you know, that's not the path. The path is to have this stuff flushed up. So if you really get what I'm saying, I mean, one time they, they asked the Course in Miracles teacher, uh, what does the Course in Miracles say about uh, life on other planets? And his reply was, uh, the Course says that there's no life on this planet. Terms, you can see where it's going to be a torturous journey. 
because bodies do seem to, to deteriorate and age. Bodies do seem to break down and die. Bodies leave, uh, even aside from sickness and, and death, you know. There's these, you hear these relationships that go on for 20, 30, 40 years, and then I'm out of here. I was in Florida this past year, and I went to visit a man who, who started an attitudinal healing center and a Course in Miracles center after his teenage daughter was murdered. And, and they ended up, him and his wife started this healing center to forgive uh, this man and to heal in their hearts because their teenage daughter was murdered. They named their whole center, Lauren Quinn Center, after the daughter. So, uh, this goes through many years of healing. He was a, a medical doctor who got so into this healing that it, it took over his life. He just mm -hmm. wanted to get into the joy of God. And so he really got, got out of the profession of being a, a surgeon and got so into this that it brought so much joy into his life. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the center closed and um, uh, I was visiting recently. I did a gay course of miracles gathering like over a decade. So I was visiting this past year and after all that him and his wife went through, with the center and everything, and after 30-some years of marriage, his wife said, I've got a good friend, he's a lot younger, he's beautiful, and I'm moving to Greece with him. Sayonara. <laughs> Walked right out of his life. So when I showed up, here's my friend, Jack, and it's almost like somebody stuck a dagger in his heart and was going like this to it. Because he always thought, you know, I'll, I'll be here, we'll sit there like on Golden Pond, and we're going to just watch the sunset together, and we made it through our daughter being murdered, and all these years. And he thought at least they would just, you know, be there together in the end. And she, she had fears of aging, you know, he was about 10 years older, and started to get the wrinkles, and she got a face split, and I thought, you know, she was really afraid of death. And this husband, you know, after all he went through, was like a symbol. So by the time I get there, you know, he's like, he said, David, these past months I've gone through uh, rage, jealousy, envy, uh, unworthiness. He even mentioned every ego feeling in the book, you know, to the max. Like there's a dagger in there just turning and turning and turning. And I went in there and I was like, give me that dagger. I said, Jack, I said, people aren't really people. People just reflect your own beliefs and your own thoughts. And and your wife, she still loves you. I don't care how it looks on the surface. No one, she, she's not walking away because she doesn't love you. She's just reflecting your own doubt thought about your Christ self. You're eternal. You're eternal. And that's just a doubt thought about, about who you are. That's a, thought, that's a doubt thought about aging and about sickness and everything. And I said, and your doubt thought just moved to Greece. <laughs> and she just went, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, now we can get busy here. <laughs> You've got a purpose in life. Uh, let's get busy finding what that purpose is. Uh, you're here. And you've got this big house, this monstrosity of a house, but do you really need such a big house? Uh, no, I think I really would like to simplify a little bit. That's what my heart's telling me. I mean, I, I had a couple guys out on the street coming in uh, that I met offering to buy his house. I said, uh, if you could do anything in the world now, where you are right now, what would you do? And he said, go fishing. <laughs> Good old boy from Mississippi. Fishing. That's what I call meditation. You ever go fishing and just be out there and just you and the sky, that boat and them waves lapping up there? I could tell that was his way of saying, I want to meditate. I said, I think you should go fishing. Simplify your life. I said, is there any skills and abilities you got? Well, I always like to write these metaphysical stories. You want to see one? He showed it to me. I put it on my website. I got it on my website now. It's so good. It's about, it's called the big casino game. It's about a casino game where everybody gets caught up in all this fear and guilt. And then finally, this coach comes along, which is a Holy Spirit figure, and helps them escape the casino game and, and wake up from the casino game. He, he writes these metaphysical stories. I said, I said, you know how helpful and healing these stories are? You know, I want to take this story and put it on the web. 
I just helped him focus in on his life's call, on his purpose. You know, and that's what it's, that story is the same for all of us. Uh, when we put too much faith in in a person, in a partner, in a, a job, in a whatever, those are idols. We just are we're we're asking for a, a beating psychologically when those things fall apart, when people move away, when people get sick and die. And the world we see is just a reflection of our thoughts. So what I'm saying is, this is a message of such joy that is saying. Follow your heart, you know, do just what Robin's been doing. She just got to the point where it's like, I can't go on with this thing. Uh, logically, this may not seem to be the best move, you know, if I've got a family to support and I've got a job in a, in a world where there seems to be jobs, people don't even have jobs, uh, but I've got to follow my heart. I've got, a, I've got a song to sing, I've got a painting to paint, I've got something to express that's waiting to come through me that's going to bring me so much joy when it pours through that I will feel like, wow, I did it, I made the right decision there. <laughs> and when I first started doing this, I was in college thinking, oh, I'll give a little time to meditation or play some music I like or this or that, but I've got to get back to those serious things here, you know, <laughs> a prudent, practical things. But the more I gave myself to some of these little spiritual endeavors, the more joy I felt and the more I started to say, maybe this isn't so impractical after all, the spiritual side. Maybe if I would just give more and more at just devoting my part and my attention to this. And I actually thought, I would love to do, I, I love having hard to hard talks with people, just really getting into the exciting, joyful talks. And I thought to myself, boy, it'd be fun if I could just do this my whole life. Mm -hmm. And the little boy said, you can. And that's what my whole life has been. Yes, I enjoy speaking to groups and conferences and everything, but, you know, we all have a lot of those one-on-one -on -one times, like you mentioned at the hospital with the people that are there, the patients. We have lots of one-on-ones that happen every day, and each one of those is our chance to really share the joy of who we really are. And that's really what it's all about. You know, it's not about starting some big movement in the world, it's about being clear for yourself that you have a great, holy function and that it's time. This is a wake-up call. We wouldn't all be sitting here in this room uh, even having this conversation mm -hmm. if it wasn't clear that it's time, that the, the bell is ringing. You know, that's absolutely true. I, I think I had that call a long time ago, but I just kind of had to go so we have uh, a little bit of a question of procrastination and is there anything else that anyone would like to use as a launching point? My name is Tyrone and uh, I'd like to give some shout outs to Robin and Terry for starting the Course of Miracles in your course. Sentimental. Um, we uh, started a year ago, tomorrow, and you're, you know, today. And it's ironic, or I'll say divine order, the way it all, like you said, uh, like a finale, uh, you know, the grand opening yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you're here today, um, and it's a, a course of miracle day for us, um, um, you know, Monday. And um, I, mean, I, I mean, you know, we started a year ago. In um, all the transition that happened with everyone, and especially Robin getting this started, and look how the year for us in court ended. This was truly a miracle. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I like to um, thank the. I like to say I'm grateful for being a part of that, and I would like the people that have been in our class uh, for a whole year. I like to thank them for being in the class and. Uh, I've, I've also noticed in, uh, uh, a lot of uh, transitions and good transitions that we all went through and uh, made it thus far. And uh, like I was saying, I was uh, really happy to see, uh, I hope I say this right, Kawaki. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank And for him to be 
if you're this night as well, it does add to that, um, like I said, that divine order. And we're all here for purpose and a reason. And I, I'm, the ones that I don't know, I still feel we all are, like I said, we're all one connected. And uh, I'm all glad, I'm glad to be a uh, part of you all as, as well. And David, um, now I wanted to say if we don't meet again in this lifetime, we will another time, whatever. But I said, no, that's not true, but we'll always be. Come on, I <laughs> <laughs>